any major majority of it. And now that we're kind of on the other side of it, of the pandemic, of the panini, now it now my technology gets spicy. So I'm going to, I'm going to, Sully, I'm going to shut up. You have William, our director from Lazaro and the Shark. So you'll have a great conversation and you've got like 20 minutes and I'm absolutely going to shut up now. Hi, Mr. William. Hi, Sally. How are you doing? Good. Um, this is Nathan Billy Rodas with the Hollywood Times with William, the director of Lazaro and the Shark, right? Yes, that's right. Lazaro and the Shark. Okay. This documentary takes a comprehensive boost on the ground look at poverty in Cuba. A big task to undertake. How did you manage that? <laughs> well, yeah, the poverty is everywhere you go yeah, in Cuba, right? So it's not easy, to, uh, I mean, it's not easy to, to avoid capturing it. I think what uh, what we did, and I'm very proud of, to to uh, have managed it that way, was to present it in a very elegant and dignified manner. You know, in a way that um, people are not seen as, as victims. You know, but they don't glamorize. Or, or romanticize the poverty either, but yeah, that was not uh, our mission or the mission of the field. I right? said, like, to see how poor, poor Cubans they live, they live some in such poverty, you know. Exactly. Yeah, especially if you have the the, the carnival as a backdrop, right? It kind of is supposed to be about beauty and colors and celebration and music and glitter and glamour. And you see the you know the hard time that they get that they they have to to make it happen. Yeah, I understand that. And you did really good with that. Um were the police scenes acted or did they actually happen like the Say say that again. Were the police scenes acted, or did they actually happen like they were? Oh yeah, this this uh, is totally one hundred percent true and real. One hundred percent. Um, yeah. It feels I know it feels sometimes like it's fiction, but that's uh you know, benefit to the team, the editors, the the camera people, the audio, the producers. Um, yeah, we were able to pull it through. And I know I, know I, I find at times it's, it's the sounds and, and uh, it feels like you're watching a fiction film. And then it is only a couple of times that you can hear my voice kind of pierce through the fourth wall and people wake up and say, and remember, oh, yeah, actually, this, yeah, I'm watching a doc. Wow. Wow. Yeah, because I was like, whoa. How did they manage that? Because there must have been a cameraman, right? Yeah. In the middle it, of that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we had, at some points, we had two or three cameras. Uh Luckily, technology is such right now that is uh, cameras are, you know, small cameras can get you a really high quality footage, and it's easy to hide and easy to carry, and you don't call a lot of attention to yourself. And luckily, technology in Cuba is like you know behind in most things. So it's, yeah, in cameras, they, you know, the policemen were not particularly familiar with that type of cameras and the, that size. So it didn't pose a threat to them. Uh, 
and then next thing you know, we are in the middle of it, and they don't even realize that we're filming. You, you know, so yeah. So the score was a big part of the movie. How did you pull that off, too? What part? The musical score. Oh, the musical score. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we had uh, uh, one of my best friends, you know, we call each other brother. Uh, he is a great musician, Alexei Marti. <laughs> and he was working with us from the beginning, you know, and he's called the music for this, this movie. And then we had another one, award-winning musician from Cuba, Jose Maria Vidier. Uh, he came and scored for the film, too, in the audience. And, uh, yeah, we were lucky to work with uh, some really, really good Cuban musicians. Then we have Willie Keys, who composed uh, one song for the, uh, the song in the final credits. And, yeah, yeah. That, that was yeah that was uh, that was definitely a significant part of uh, the post production pro process you know the music and you can feel it in the film you know it's uh, you can escape it. So when did this idea come along? That was uh, early two thousands. You know, a friend of mine and he's also ex executive producer in the film Tomas Montoya told me about <clears throat> he wanted he wanted to do this documentary about the congas in Cuba and the parades the invasion parade and then um, you know we were living in New Orleans both of us in New Orleans there is a something that's called second life parades it's every Sunday pretty similar to a conga but with brass brass instruments and uh, so it was easy or you know it was always a reminder about you know we have to go to Cuba and make this film every Sunday every weekend you know you hear the brass band going by and you see the parade the people dancing in the second line you say oh man we have to make that film in Cuba and then eventually we got it together and then you know we started going there and then we uh, started making it um and, you know, Lazaro's wife got pregnant with triplets. And then when we saw that, we said, oh, I think that we have a story now. <laughs> we have a story now. And then, you know, the rest was finding the conflicts and making sure that we have access to the characters and filming them in the crucial moments and uh, get the arc. Uh, they find another character, Nico, the one guy who lives in Miami. Uh, that was really important to the story. We have we had the poet, which was uh, uh, really important in the story as well because he chronicles the Cuban reality in a way that you know very few people do. Yeah, about, about the reality, uh, the vicissitudes that they go through in a daily basis. He's witty, got a great sense of humor, got a big heart. He's a proud father, and uh, he adds a lot of, you know, elements to the story that, that, was, that was great. So, yeah. Um, what is the whole Venezuela Cuba thing? I, I kind of understand it, but not fully. Venezuela and Cuba? Yeah. Their relationship? Yeah. Okay. Uh, ideologic. Basically, I started all, all started with uh, back when Hugo Chavez was the president of Venezuela. Uh, when we became president at first, in, I think it was in early 2000, 2001, 2000 or something like that. And uh, he found an alley in Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro obviously was still alive at the at the time, and he found in Venezuela a strategic and geopolitical ally. And 
what Hugo Chavez needed was a key to rule Venezuela forever. Basically, could be to become a dictatorship. And um, so Fidel Castro was willing to give him those keys and those formulas. It's an ideological formula, and it's called communism, in exchange for oil. And that's basically the relationship that they had then, and they still have it, even though now Fidel Castro is no longer there, and and and, and Chavez is not there either. So what they do is um, Cuba sends doctors to Venezuela, and Venezuela pays Cuba with oil and cash sometimes. And it's been that, like that for a long, long, long time, too long. So I can read and write Spanish. Um, the subtitles don't always translate specifically to English, but what is the balance between adding rhetoric and translating completely? What is the what? Balance between like writing rhetoric into it that makes sense. Right. Yes. Uh for example, I'll give you one example. Uh for example with a poet. And you know, of course everybody goes related. Yeah, of course it's it's hard to translate a poem into a foreign language. You know? Now with film, it's even more challenging because you certainly have a limited time on the subtitles on the screen, right? You don't want to um, kind of upset the trust that the audience has given you to watch your film, you don't want to punish them by putting a lot of subtitles that they have to spend a lot of time writing, I mean, reading all the time, while missing the moving picture, the subtle elements in the screen that are not characters of any language. So there's um, an example with the poet. He says one of his chances, one of his chance was uh, translated like we are an island surrounded by sea, yet there is no fish in the market. That's not exactly how, what he says if you translate it literally word by word in Spanish. But if I do that, one, it would be a very long sentence. Uh, second, people would not understand what the hell is he talking about because it's something that only happens in Cuba. From the whole world, maybe Russia, Ukraine in the 40s or 50s, I don't know, under Stalin, maybe. Maybe North Korea, I don't know right now. But apart from those two places, Cuba is still happening right, right now, right nowadays. It's something that has to do with rations and food and it's crazy. So anyway, that's one example. That's the best way I can explain what is the difference, what, 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 when is the line that we have to cross. Can you explain more about the carnival? For example? Like what it is? Yes, or not so gas? Yeah. Uh... <clears throat> The thing with the carnival in Cuba is um, that makes it, you know, in, in a way, sort of unique. It's uh, it's well, well, it's celebrating. It's celebrated in July. Secondly, it's totally govern government sponsored, and of of course, controlled by the government too. And in Santiago de, Co de Cuba, also there is. Uh, the competition in during the carnival. So different 
communities have their groups and they comp compete against each other. For example, the Congas, there's eight Congas in the city right now. And they, you know, they have a lot of rivalry and they, they compete. Uh, you know, once it's the, the drummers play, it's like 15 or 20 drummers at a time. They go marching and then behind the drummers, there's choreographies and there are flags and stuff that, you know, the people move, there are masks that they wear. There's a whole army of dancers behind the conga and they march through the street like maybe three or four blocks and there's a jury that are watching and then there's people in both sides watching and, you know, screaming and yelling and stuff like that while they go through. Uh, it happens like every night for like uh, a week, a week or 10 days or something like that, you know. And then, um, yeah, at the end of the day, at the end of the last day, they give their prizes. And then, you know, usually people are very upset when they lose, you know. Sometimes, uh, sometimes um, there is even fights. Sometimes, you know, because uh, you know the passion that these people have and the work that they put in their group for a whole year. Sometimes for years, you know. So yeah, that's that's uh, yeah, that's some of the highlights of uh, when I think of Carnival in Santiago. Ideologically, there is nothing communist about a dictatorship. Where do you think that communist governments go wrong in their implementation of communism? Well, the communists. Okay. Well, first of all, they they have a, they are ruled by a communist party. Okay, it's a communist party that has ruled the island of Cuba for sixty three years. No competition. No other parties allowed, no other uh, voice is allowed. There is no other press that that is allowed, or radio, or TV, or film, or songs that are allowed without the permission and the consent of the Communist Party. There's only one press, one TV, one radio, media completely owned by the Communist Party. So that is a totalitarian regime. The army is owned by the Communist Party. The bank, the commerce, everything. The fish, the cows, everything. <laughs> uh, so one leader, which is not voted by the people, is voted and uh, selected amongst themselves. A cast of like, Nine, the bureau is called the political bureau of the Communist Party, and there are like nine or sixteen members. I don't remember. Maybe it's like 16, 14, 16 of them. They select the next leader, and that's the rule has been under. Um, my my country has been under for six, like I said, sixty three years, and the ideology is Marx, Marxism. Okay, that's the ideology. And what is that called? Communism. And it's a very strong ideology that preaches unity and equality and this and that and the other. And then it all ends in poverty because it doesn't allow for private property. The state owes, owns everything and controls every single part of the society. Even what you are going to eat or drink, you know, or wash your body with anything. Yeah, I was, I, what I was wondering is what is the shift between the communist ideology and the um, Communist Party. Like what? Like where did where did they go wrong? You know what I mean. Where did I go wrong? What? Where, where did I, it's from the beginning, the inception of it. It's it's unnatural. It's unnatural to think 
that one man, one party can convince everybody who thinks the same way and practice the same ideology. Once you pretend that that's possible, then you're going to have to force people to either be quiet and don't say what they want to say. When you do that, you use the force. You have to use force. You have to use repression and incarceration to intimidate people and to tell them, look, if you speak out, if you try to make another party to compete with me, this is going to happen to you. Or, but you can you can have like you know I don't know only people thinking the same way pretty much 200 2000 11 million then you have to you have you know you have to use force and then when you use force you become a dictatorship you repress yeah. people you don't let people watch and, and write and read what they want to read you are a dictator. <laughs> It's as simple as that. It's, it, and that's that's the the promise is we are going to all be equal. Uh, there's not going to be poverty. Uh, we're going to re, you know give everything equally to everybody. Um, that's unnatural. Men are not built like that. I agree. Pretend if you pretend, you are going to become a dictator. Or you're going to support a dictatorship because you know you're not being honest with yourself. I mean, there's many, many experiments in the world that people have, they try to do it. They try to do it many times. Even in America, they try to do the, you know, like the hippie commune thing and everything. It always ends up in a horrible disaster. <laughs> you know, unfortunately. Yeah. I wish. Work. Everybody wish it would work. It doesn't. You have to pretend. Okay, we'll go to Cuba or watch Last Hour on the Chart. Where can we watch the movie? Right now, it's playing at. Uh, we was already sold out at the festival. Uh, the premiere as Saturday, Saturday night, and then it's playing again on Monday, um, two fifteen, in the afternoon. That show will still have some, some, a few tickets available, I think, as of this morning. And then you can, obviously, you can go to the festi festival website, which is darknyc.net, find the film. It's in the international competition, one out of 12 films. And uh, you can watch it online uh, through the festival website. They, have, they make a link available. You obviously you have to buy access to it, and you know you can watch it. And, um, really cool. So, yeah. Is there any social media that we can follow? Yes, yes, of course. Film? Sorry, we have at the last time on the chat, Instagram, they always posting it. Uh, yeah, we have a media team that is really, really, really on top of it. They are great. There's a lot of, um, uh, outtakes and deleted scenes in the Instagram. You can follow me in Instagram. It's uh, Saborin William. Um, it's, that's uh, S-A-B-O-U-R-I-N William. Uh, my my Instagram um, feed is uh, filled with a lot of uh, outtakes as well. And uh, a lot of uh, goodies. A lot, a lot deleted scenes and things about the characters that you're not going to find in the movie. Uh, the website also, lastaroundthechart.com. The website, at the end of the website, I think there's a page full with uh, deleted scenes that we constantly uh, are putting more and more stuff there. Um, yeah, and then we have Twitter, we have uh, Instagram, and we have, what else, Facebook too, Last Around the Chart. All right, this has been Sally Olivares with the Hollywood Times with Mr. William Savorin. William Savorin, the creator of Lazaro and the Shark.
Did I keep it under 20 minutes? Huh. You did you did brilliantly. Thank you so much, Sully. We really appreciate you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Sully. It'll, it'll and, be up when oh, when okay. I, Huh? What? Well, uh, you said when will it be up? Whenever um I send it to Miss Judy. Perfect. Thank you, Sully. We really appreciate you once again. And then, um, William, before I let you go, just quickly, uh, our interview before this, David apparently was feeling fluish. He laid down and he just woke back up. So I might schedule him for tomorrow afternoon after our other one, but I'll keep you posted. Okay. Th thank you so much. All right, I'm I'm releasing you to go do something fun and enjoy yourself and, and chat with other people. Have a good afternoon. Oh, you too. Bye-bye. Both. Bye. Bye.